Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today I have the great pleasure of sitting down with one of Canada's great treasures and the world's great treasures, Oliver Jones, a top class pianist who studied under or was a protege, so to speak, of Oscar Peterson. Now, Mr. Jones, you came up in Montreal in 1934. That's amazing that we have somebody um, here today who walked among giants, so to speak, because you, as a child, got a chance to hear Oscar practicing, right? That's right. Uh, 1934 was when I was born, and uh, we moved uh, close to the Peterson family, probably about 15 doors from Oscar. Wow. Uh, at the, when I was uh, seven and a half years old. And uh, of course, at that time, uh, Oscar was already getting started. Mm. You see? And uh, when he was 15, he had his first radio program. And uh, I was studying under another teacher and then being so inspired by Oscar, I told my parents I want to switch to have Daisy teach mm, me. His sister. And uh, it was a wonderful time uh, uh, in Montreal because at that time we had about 650 clubs. Wow, 650. Uh, so 650 to 680 for sure. And uh, Montreal was considered the Paris mm. of North America. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, right in the middle of everything was, was Oscar Peterson. And uh, so, like myself and so many others, we were all mm. inspired with what he, he had done. But it was a little more unique for me because I was the one that was living, the closest pianist living uh, close to the Peterson family. And uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful uh, relationship. I continue to have it up until today with the whole family because uh, uh, Chuck, uh, Oscar's older brother, who was a tr trumpet player, and I had worked uh, later in my years uh, together quite often and really was a good friend. Mm -hmm. And of course, the wonderful training that I received from Daisy herself, uh, really, she opened a whole different world to me. Uh, uh, the world of classical music, uh, but she also made sure that we knew a lot about life and what to expect mm. and how hard to work. Uh, I've always said this, that I've never met another pianist or musician, both classical or jazz, that had more discipline than Oscar Peterson. And, uh, but it was really strange for me because growing up, I had no, no idea that I would ever become a professional uh, pianist. But somehow the rest of the neighborhood decided, well, Oscar has done it, now it's your turn. Mm. And I think not realizing that what a monumental task they were talking about. But uh, he was always very, very uh, encouraging. Uh, and uh, my best friend lived right next door to, to the Peterson family. So I would go over there and uh, visit Ronnie and uh, spend half of my afternoons listening to music or waiting for Oscar to play mm. because uh, both Daisy and me and they were all playing piano. Mm. So there was always students there but I knew about what time the Oscar usually practiced, so uh, I used to try to be on, whether we were playing baseball or hockey, whatever it was, I, I was <laughs> cocking my ear. And uh, of course what happened is that after my, my lesson with, with Daisy, uh, I would always sit down and play something for her. Uh, and I felt privileged because 
most of us who were studying classical music at the time, uh, especially from the nuns and so forth, they would not allow us to do anything else but uh, our classical studies. Mm -hmm. But no, due to the fact that Daisy was familiar with jazz music, uh, I would sit down after, and so sometime Oscar would come in or Chuck would come in and, and say, well, you're working on this and, uh, uh, well, perhaps you can uh, try it this way or that way. But I must tell you a story uh, that I remember vividly until today. Uh, one time I was just passing by and uh, one of the family said, come in, quick. Mm. And so <laughs> I ran, I went upstairs and uh, so Oscar said to me, I want you to meet this young man. Uh, he's, he's just starting out, he wants to be a jazz player. By this time, I guess I was 12 or 13 years old. And so I remember sitting down and this man, just some old and elderly man, what, what I thought was elderly mm. at the time. And uh, so I sat and I remember I played Don't Blame Me. Mm. And uh, all the while this, this man behind me was saying, mm. 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 He didn't say anything more than that. So I'm getting kind of nervous and I, and I still didn't know who he was. So I was, while I was playing this song, uh, Don't Blame Me, he was just sitting behind me and Oscar was, I was worked, I had worked on this a little bit. Anyway, so when I got finished, this man sat down and he did this, all those ones, and he started playing Don't Blame Me, one hand. And so, I'm saying this guy plays as well as Oscar. I find out that it's Art Tatum. Whoa! I didn't really know who Art Tatum was at that time mm. when I was that young, and uh, it was just something else to see what he wow. he was able to do. And uh, one of the greatest pianists in history, probably the greatest. Mm -hmm. Uh, the greatest uh, solo pianist, for sure, I find. And uh, so that really, truly was my introduction to really a lot of, of uh, the very, very wonderful pianists that were coming through Montreal at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Art had remained Oscar's favorite pianist, and he kind of chased them uh, for years, the same way that Tiger Woods is trying to chase uh, Jack Nicholas. Mm. Uh, but uh, it, it was a wonderful time. Uh, I had started to play in the clubs at about the age of nine or ten on the weekends, whenever my parents would allow. But uh, the whole scene here uh, in the area in St. Henry was very conducive to to music because most of uh, the black musicians from the U.S. usually came through here. Uh, as I remember seeing Sarah come through here uh, in the 50s and uh, Ella several times, Nat King Cole, uh, Louis Armstrong, they all came through, uh, a lot of them before they were, I remember Pearl, uh, Pearl Bailey Mm -hmm. coming here and uh, no one even knew who she was wow. and of course Sammy Davis Sammy uh, spent a lot of time here in Montreal and uh, went to school here any Charlie Parker no but that's my favorite because I, I'm a frustrated alto saxophonist oh and uh, Al McLean he told me he fixed your yeah, horn yeah he fixed my horn uh, uh, but I, I still sound bad he, he did a good job but I I still don't sound good. Well, you know, as a musician of your stature, uh, I've run into other great piano players such as Mulgrew Miller, 
if you got that swing and you got that thing, you can sound good on any instrument. Well, you know what it is? You don't have the capacity uh, on that other instrument as you would on your main mm -hmm. instrument. Uh, but I, but I, Charlie Parker probably is my favorite musician of all times. Mm. Yeah, I really I got the chance to see him twice uh, wow. live uh, in Montreal and uh, just outstanding. And mm. Of course, he passed away too, way too early. Yeah, he had so much more to give, and uh, uh, what, what a tremendous musician. Mm. Well, you know, thank you for sharing such a integral and important story for us. Because to to be with somebody who's been in direct lineage and in touch with our Tatum, and our Tatum goes back to Earl Hines, it goes back to um, cats like Jelly Roll Morton and that that evolution backward for you to be involved with that I'm sure you look backward as well as forward you know so well the thing about it is that at, at the time I, I remember uh, uh, Earl Hines coming here and mm. him playing upstairs and myself playing downstairs mm. uh, that was a thrill at Rockhead's uh, Paradise okay and uh, so many great musicians came through here, and of course, a lot, a, a lot of the musicians from the United States came, came through with different groups and just fell in love with Montreal mm -hmm. and decided to stay. So they would, a lot of them would bring a lot of the new tunes that were were going on, and uh, uh, they ended up marrying ladies from here and raising their children. Mm -hmm. And quite a few of them uh, uh, s still live in Montreal and, and the surrounding cities. Mm -hmm. Well, as you said, this is like the Europe of North America. It surely was. And I'm sure racism was not as happening here as it was for in the, the South. South. Well, this is uh, one of the things. Uh, one of the things that surprised me the most, John, mm -hmm. was that uh, we were playing uh, a gig, I remember. Uh, I got a late call, and uh, a couple of the guys from the States were, were playing with us, and I, I saw they were uncomfortable. And uh, so one of, the, one of the brothers said to me, I'm not sh sure how to, to, to take it because it was the first time that he had ever been on the bandstand with a white musician. Oh, okay. And of course, growing up here, we had always worked with mm. with uh, anybody that you choose to. If you mm. could play, you had a gig. And uh, of course, we ran into racism here, but I do remember some of the places that wanted only black musicians, uh, especially going way up north in that. Uh, in parts of Quebec, that it was a novelty and an honor to have uh, all black groups. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's just a tremendous uh, city, and I'm so proud of what this festival has done. Because I remember the first, I, I came back from Puerto Rico in 1980. Mm -hmm. I had been living in Puerto Rico for 16 years. And so I came back the year after it started started and I remember they only had four people in the office mm. and turned into one of the well, greatest festivals festival. in the world and you know you are um, so beloved by the people here in Quebec you won the highest honor in Quebec right they awarded you with oh yes I have been medal and I have like congressional a Medal of Honor, uh, wow. equivalent to that. And you have the Martin Luther King Award. Martin Luther King, Jackie Robinson Award. Jackie, who I I got to know when I was a youngster. Wow. I, I, he didn't live too far from uh, my neighborhood. Mm. And uh, uh, I've been extremely, really accepted and continued to, to this day. So I'm... This year, next year, will be uh, 75 years of performing. Mm. 
I did my first concert at the age of five at the Union United Church, the church that Oscar and I, I grew up in. And uh, are you, am I right? Are you turning 80 next year? Next year, yeah. 80th birthday celebration next year. You better be I'm, like I'm, Wayne Shorter. I'm, I'm gonna try. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was so, so so sorry to be with uh, Miss uh, Wayne this time. I was in watching mm. Joshua at the same time. You know, that's one thing that's frustration with this festival because there's so much great stuff happening all at once, and yeah, you wish you could <laughs> clone yourself and be able to experience <laughs> it all. That's right. It's it's been great. I've been watching it grow, mm. and uh, of course, it's the only time of the year that I try to make sure that I'm home. Mm. Uh, and uh, this year, I, I live six months in, in Florida in the oh, okay. time and come back. That's smart. <laughs> it's yeah. cold over here. <laughs> but I came back this year for the greatest honor ever. I received uh, a Canadian stamp wow. in my honor. And uh, just Oscar and myself are the only two musicians who have uh, received it. So I, wow. uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. And I'm, I must say that uh, people of, of uh, Canada have uh, not all, only all honored us personally, mm -hmm. but the music. It, it's kind of legitimized the music of jazz, which for years have stayed in the basements and the speakeasies in the shadows, and, yeah, yeah. And, and brought it to light. And I've noticed the, uh, the tremendous amount of, of young people who are playing music in Canada now. Mm. In the smallest of cities uh, that we go into, we always run into young monsters, uh, 17, 18 years old. And I'm saying to myself, where in God's name did they, what has inspired them, you know? People like you. Uh, I hope so. The Doxus brothers. You've been working with them, right? Yes, very, very. I've known uh, both Jim and Chet since they were eight or nine years old. Wow. And uh, just to see what they have done, and uh, I will continue to do, because they're uh, two of the finest young men also. Mm -hmm. Just a tremendous gentleman. And uh, I, I know that their parents are very proud. And uh, watching them grow from such an early age mm. and of course Jim has been my my drummer for the last uh, nine years now just a wonderful individual he's so swinging you know I had a pleasure of sitting in with him in the, in the session and it was it was real happening it was a train and the whole audience was clapping on the two and four and it was just happening you know? uh -huh. but um, you know uh, I'm sure that must be really a pleasure to, to be able to play with some of these young youngsters who are really uh, becoming powerhouse musicians. It is. And the thing about it is that uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, going into the elementary schools and motivations mm -hmm. and so forth. And uh, I think that's where it, where it starts. That's important, you know. I remember when I, when I came back uh, well, years ago, uh, I was wondering if we would ever catch up, or would it always mm -hmm. be the two that we looked to were Oscar Peterson and Maynard Ferguson. Uh, they were the two that were able to get out and become household names in jazz. Mm -hmm. And now we have so many more youngsters finally uh, in their doing their things. Dues. Most of them are going to study in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully that they're, they'll come back. I. Uh, I started working uh, probably about 14 years ago. I was doing concerts and I had a young lady that started to open for me. Mm. And from the time that she hit the bandstand, I knew that she was going to be something. And uh, that was young Diana Crawl. Wow. She used to open for me. And uh, two years ago, we did an homage to, to uh, Oscar Peters and her friends. Mm. And now this time I'm opening for her. Wow! But uh, <laughs> she, she she hasn't changed. She's just a wonderful, yeah, yeah young uh, uh, entertainer, and she'll continue to. Yeah, do. she's got some great stuff with Russell Malone. He's a great fan. Yeah, I, I I love that group. Mm. Uh, I saw her a lot with uh, 
Uh, I was at the session when she did it with, uh, with Ray Brown and Jeff Hamilton. And, uh, and ever since that period, she's just grown and grown. Mm -hmm. and so hopefully, uh, jazz will be alive in Canada for another 100 or 200 years, hopefully. Well, we, we, it will live on in, in people such as you. And um, just before we end, because I know you, you're pressed for time, um, talk a little bit about these um, years in the 80s and you know working with some really fantastic musicians. You know, you recorded a duo with Hank Jones, for example. Well, yeah. Hank, who I, I thought was endless, He's one. Of, he, he he's a rarity because most of us, the older uh, generation, always. We, I know I've gotten stuck in the eighties and seventies, but Hank, as old as he he became, you could never tell what age he was. Forward thinking, yeah. Always, mm. tremendous player. Yeah. Uh, but I probably. The greatest thrill that I got has been man, with uh, Clark Terry, mm. uh, Ray Brown, uh, Ed Thickpen, uh, Barney Kessel, mm. uh, Herb Ellis. Uh, yeah. Uh, so many. And I had the wonderful opportunity uh, when I was 16 years old to sit in with Louis Armstrong. Whoa. And what no. happened is that. He was he was doing a concert here, and Marty Napoleon, his pianist at the time, I uh, got hung up at the border, and so the last minute, uh, a good friend of mine uh, from the states, a good friend of Louis, who was living here, and he said, "Come on down quickly, they need somebody to fill in for." And so I got a chance to to play a couple of tunes with. Uh, Lewis. Wow, that's fantastic, man, you know, and um, Ray Brown, man, I'm a bass player, you know, I'm sure you got some great stories, you know, I saw a couple of these uh, great films that were made, you and Oscar Peterson and the duo with the, the great rhythm section that included uh, Niels Henning, Niels, and yeah. oh, Niels, Niels, uh, God bless his soul, passed away far too young. Far too young, far too young. Any, any stories about working with those guys and... Anything you could share with us? Well, uh, also uh, the drummer at the time uh, uh, is still a good friend of mine, uh, mm. Alvin Queen, mm. and uh, and of course uh, Dave Young. Those were the two uh, wonderful players. Dave, I've worked with mm. for twenty years, and uh, I had the wonderful, probably one of my favorite was Red Mitchell, who I had. Wonderful pleasure of working with. Mm. It was like working with with another pianist because he was so yeah. melodic yeah. and uh, constantly. I, I had to kind of change my whole approach because Red was was constantly uh, going back and forth uh, from melody to tempo. Mm -hmm. It was it was a wonderful experience. Wow. I did quite a bit of work with uh, Red. But uh, James Moody, uh, one of my favorite uh, horn players, mm. and I had a, such a tremendous time working with him. Uh, so over the years, uh, I consider myself extremely lucky uh, because every day you sit down to the piano playing, I find out there's something else to learn. Mm. And... Uh, one of the greatest examples was was watching Hank Hank Jones uh, uh, play. With, with he and he was just ageless because mm -hmm. his mind was so active, and he was constant. He would sit down. And he did. I remember seeing him do the concert with myself here one night, and then I two other nights he played with Brad. And uh, he 
he just melted into the same mold that uh, every pianist that he that he, that he was working with. Yeah, and that's a that's a, a gift. And he he was just uh, one of the most the brightest uh, players that I worked with. Benny Carter uh, was another favorite of mine. Who uh, we worked a lot in in Europe together, mm. and. Uh, so I have a lot of memories. When I That's when great. I decide finally to to retire, I can sit back and say that yes, I've been touched yeah. by a, a lot of wonderful musicians. Thanks for dropping some history. You know that's uh, really important for us youngsters who don't get that chance to have that first exposure. I mean, Louis Armstrong can be credited as one of the founding members of jazz, and for you to be able to play with him at 16 is just profound. You know. That's just, uh, it must have been a wonderful experience. Um, before we finish up, two things. I've got two things to request of you. One, Mulgrew Miller was a great uh, teacher and mentor of mine, almost like a father figure. And I'd like to get your take a little bit on him if you feel comfortable about it. Because um, I'm sure you and him have crossed paths. Well, I remember Mulgrew, uh, the first time that I, I worked in New York, and uh, I looked at the bar, and here, I thought I recognized him, you know, and uh, he was right there up at the first time that I worked at, uh, where was that? That's right. It was in New York? Right? In New York, yeah. And uh, Bradley's maybe or Sweet Basil's? Or? Sweet Basil's, mm -hmm. at Sweet Basil's. And, uh, Every night that I played, I'd look up and Malta would, would be there. Big smile on his face. Uh, and one of the swingingest pianists that I've ever met. Mm. So we became very, very close. Uh, we didn't get a chance to see each other often, but when I did get the opportunity, I was always joyful for me. And uh, he's going to be missed. Much too young. So what he missed. Yeah. It's almost. Uh, he was only a year younger than Niels, who, who passed, you know, 58 as well, you know, it's just such a tragic thing. Yeah. To lose these, these like, virtuosos and masters of their instruments, you know, and it must be hard for someone at your established age to see those guys go before you, you know. Because you know they have so much potential, they mm -hmm. have so much more to offer. Yeah. And, uh, it's really, uh, I have the great pleasure of doing duo with George Sharon, wow. uh, Dave Brubeck, uh, Marilyn McPartland, mm -hmm. a few times. Piano jazz? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it's, it's such a pleasure to look across, but probably the greatest thrill of all was the, the 2004 concert that I had with uh, O.P. Yeah, and uh, uh, I knew that he was very, very sick at the time. Mm. And uh, over the years, we we spoke about being able to do uh, some concerts together. And uh, I always used to tell him, "All right, we'll do a couple of duos together, but to make it fair, you only play with your thumbs." Mm. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, well, he, he became like a young man when he sat down. I, I watched a couple of those videos. Uh, I was, you know, I was just getting into jazz when you did those concerts, you know. So I'm a little bit too young for that. But I saw the videos and, wow, man, like uh, you guys will play off each other. And Oscar, what he's he was close to ninety at that point, right? No, he uh, he was well, in his eighties, right? Eighty, yeah. He was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, that's um, really fantastic concert series and anybody watching this make sure you check that out uh, the last question for you um, as a youngster you've probably had an uncomfortable or a, a, a learning experience that made you grow to the next level some some real legend who humbled you and put you in your place do you want to share with us yeah, that and, story and, and actually it was it was uh, Oscar really um, at one time after after one of my lessons, um, mm -hmm. I was sitting, sitting playing for for Daisy, 
And I remember Oscar came in and uh, he said, you should, should work on, on something. And he wrote out a couple of things for me. Mm. And that was the very, very first time that he ever came in and directed. Told, yeah. Mm. So I uh, looked at it and I came home and I had two weeks that I was supposed to work on it. Came back two weeks later and I knew I wasn't ready. But I sat down and, and tried to. And he said to me, you didn't, you, you didn't work on it, did you? I, so I said, well, I started with the excuse. And I remember I had, I used to run track and field. Okay. For, for yeah. And I said, well, I had track mate and I had this and I had that. And I remember Oscar saying to me, man, you have to make up your mind now, whether you're going to be a musician or an athlete. Mm. And he never gave me anything else to work on. But I always remember, and it's true, you, if you're going to be dedic dedicated to something, you have to work hard at it. You have to be dedicated. There's no, there's no easy road. Mm. And probably the, the, the greatest lesson that I've learned and uh, that I've always uh, told the young, youngsters playing today is don't confine yourself to one style of music. Oh, okay. Listen yeah. to everything. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the things today that I, that I listen to, when I listen to Herbie or Keith Jarrett or uh, all the guys that are playing very, very contemporary things. Jason Marino. Don't, don't, don't discard it. Listen. Find out where they're at. You may not, they may, it may not be your bag but every 12, 15 years, a new, someone comes up with something different. Mm. And it's always going to take a year or two before everyone kind of finds out what direction they're going in. Mm. And, uh, but don't forget that jazz started before Coltrane. So listen to everyone. Mm -hmm. and. That's how that's how we learn and build our repertoire and open our minds. Well, with that, I'll uh, end this interview, uh, Oliver. It was a real pleasure, and uh, hopefully, this is the first of many meetings. You know, I'd love to pick your brain again, but I know you don't have very much time right now. And it was just a, a real honor and a pleasure to sit down with you. And thank you for sharing some history. Well, my pleasure. It was a real pleasure. Looking forward to meeting you and playing together one Yeah, day. well, oh, thank you. I, I'm not sure I deserve the honor, but... <laughs> well, uh, Cats, check him out. One of the top pianists in the history of the music, Oliver Jones.